a sense of belonging is something that I've always struggled with. We've been talking for 20 minutes and 15 of those minutes have been talking about how I'm someone else's son. And this is meant to be my interview. What are you doing? You know, we moved house because parents got divorced. I was in school, then I was out of school. Then when I was at the holidays, I was half the holiday with my mom. The other half of the holiday, then I had to go with my dad. And he had another family. So it was sort of like for a little bit of the holiday, I was part of that family. But then I'd have to leave and go back to school. So there was a lot of instability, I think is probably the best way to describe my childhood. And when you grow up with a privileged lifestyle, a lot of people criticize you for that. Because for so many people, having money is the most important thing because it's very glamorized. And often, when you have money, people think you can't have any problems. Everyone is susceptible to feel every single way, regardless of background. Mental health doesn't discriminate. Mm -hmm. Whether you're male, you're female, Hindu, Muslim, rich, poor, whatever it is, mm -hmm. everyone is susceptible to feeling certain ways. Yeah. When you're going through something, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. mental, physical, whatever it is, the mind can make us believe like we are alone. Yeah. We are the only one right now feeling the way that we are. Mm -hmm. It's hopeless. No one can understand me, no one understands. But there are a lot more people who do understand than we perhaps give credit for. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of A Millennial Mind. If you haven't already, please, 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 can you do me a massive favor and press the subscribe or follow button wherever you're listening or watching to this. Only 4% of you that watch and listen to this podcast are actually following it. And the bigger the show gets, the bigger the guests get, and the bigger the experience gets too. Thank you so much for all of your support so far. Let's get into the episode. Sid. Hi. Welcome back to A Millennial Mind. I know, it's amazing. I feel so privileged to finally actually be in, you know, in the in the hot seat, in the studio. Yeah, properly. We've just done a Zoom call and then we did a book review last year. We did the book review out in the park. I know. And walking around London. And it was freezing. It was freezing and it was a little bit louder. So. And I remember my hand hurting and being annoyed at you that you didn't offer me the cam offer to hold the camera. Uh, because you wanted me in the camera. But I didn't know you that well. So now this is great because obviously we're good friends now and now I can grill you as much as I want and you can't say anything to me. No, I, I listen, I position. told you and I told you and I should say this to all your listeners and viewers as well that Shivani asked me, is there anything that I wanted to speak about or anything I was uncomfortable talking about? Mm -hmm. And I told her that nothing is off limits. She can fire away. You did. So hopefully this will be a nice open exchange. <laughs> and I love that about you. I think ever since I've known you, you've been incredibly open. You have believed in me from when I started season two, and I'll never forget that. So thank you for everything. But let's let's talk about your childhood because I want to talk today around several different things. Okay. But as I was reading your book and as I known you, I think everything always relays back. <laughs> She's got to give it a plug, right? By the way, it was, it's her, right there. it was her idea to put this in there. That is the plug. It is. Can so I just let's say, talk about your childhood. It's coming out again, re-coming out in February. New okay. publisher. It's now with Penguin. So Amazing. Yeah, and so Very go and buy it if you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so, let, so let's start with your childhood. Tell, tell me about your childhood. I mean, you know, I mean, that's a broad question in terms of... Um, what I went to boarding school when I was very young, mm -hmm. uh, just before I turned 11. And um, now looking back on it, right, it's a very young age yeah. to go. Okay. So, and the reason I, I start with that is because I've used to being away from home from a very young age. Okay. And I think that was kind of kind of a reflection of my childhood in general. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was young. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, anyway, my dad was in and out because he was traveling so much for business. He was in India and we were mm -hmm. based in the UK. So there was him coming in and out. So I was either away from him for a while or when I was in school, I was away from both parents. So yeah. I guess that, you know, to sum up my childhood, I would I would say that it was it was a solid childhood in terms of a material childhood mm -hmm. but it was a very kind of disconnected um detached detached but also sort of it was it was very there was a lot of sort of like instability yeah right instability that's the word um in terms of you know we moved house because parents got divorced i was in school then i was out of school then when it was in the holidays i was half the holiday with my mom the other half of the holiday then i had to go with my dad which is something that's common yeah. between kids uh, from divorced families. And he had another family, so it mm -hmm. was sort of like, for a little bit of the holiday, I was part of that family. 
but then I'd have to leave and go back to school. So there was a lot of instability, I think, is probably the best way to describe um, my childhood. Did you have a sense of belonging? Because I, I can imagine that's quite difficult if you're in boarding school and then you're coming home and then you're going to one yeah. family, another family. No, I think, I think you know, at the time, right, you don't really think about these things. Yeah. Um, but now looking back on it and having reflected, I think a sense of belonging is something that I've always struggled with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I was with my... My dad's family, um, they all lived together and everything. So I was just kind of like coming in and out. Yeah. I felt I wanted to be a part of that, but I never was. Mm-hmm. Um, I think then when I moved to India for a couple of years after university to work, even though um, my origins are Indian, yeah. family are Indian, I still felt like an outsider in yeah. India. I felt like I didn't belong. Mm-hmm. Um and now actually, like with the career path that I've gone through acting and stuff like that is the first time that I actually feel like a sense of belonging. And I, and I remember reading something in your book, which I found really interesting because there are a lot of people in the world who grow up with privilege. And when you grow up with a privileged lifestyle, a lot of people criticize you for that. Because for so many people, having money is the most important thing because it's very glamorized. And often when you have money, people think you can't have any problems. And people say this a lot of the time. Like if you had all the money in the world, you would understand that we still have problems coming from people who do have money. Now, reading your book, you say this a lot, that when you were growing up, you felt you could never express how you were feeling because you grew up with such a privileged background. So people would say, well, what do you have to worry about? Mm. You're blessed. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's definitely, uh, uh, and that's something that I've tried to hit on in my book, yeah. that it's it's got nothing to do really with money or anything like that. Everyone is susceptible to feel every single way, regardless of background, right? Mm -hmm. Like mental health, let's just take for example, and things that I've suffered with. Mental health doesn't discriminate. Mm -hmm. Whether you're male, you're female, uh, you're Hindu, Muslim, Mm -hmm. um, rich, poor, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. everyone is susceptible to feeling certain ways. Yeah. Um, And I'll give you a very quick anecdote. I remember this, like my, my best friend growing up, very close family, very mm-hmm. close. Him, his brother, and his parents. And I used to love it when I was around them with their parents. And he always used to tell me, um, and this is poignant because it's Christmas now, he always used to tell me about his family, what they used to do for Christmas Day, right? So it was like they'd all get up together mm-hmm. and they'd have breakfast together and they'd open presents together. It was like this this, this thing, right, yeah. that we were all together. And he'd come with me on holidays with my dad and, you know, seen certain things which yeah. he thought was the greatest thing in the world right but that was more on the material side and i always used to say to ed i was like i i, I love your family i wish i could have that christmas mm-hmm. and he always used to just look at me in like bewilderment he's like he's like but why like you have everything you want like i want that yeah and um yeah it it, it was interesting it's like it's not even that he, i was being like chastised for it yeah. but it's like it, there was this uh, you can't he couldn't understand or comprehend why would I want something else because materially everything looked fine and that's interesting isn't it so many things on the outside perhaps aren't reflective on the inside so you know you grew up in in, in London but your dad was a very well-known businessman you know he was the king of good times <laughs> Right. And yeah. <laughs> Kingfisher, if people don't know, was an incredible brand. It was a beer, right? It was an alcohol brand. It was also a lifestyle brand, right? And how people say in the UK, where's your Hoover? Hoover is a brand name. It's it's actually a vacuum cleaner. People used to say in India, give me a Kingfisher. They wouldn't say give me a beer. Correct. Growing up in that kind of lifestyle, and your dad, your granddad was very wealthy, but your dad took the business to another level. Mm-hmm. Growing up in that world where your dad is so famous and everyone is obsessed with him and he's essentially labeled as the king of good times like a king of india basically <laughs> how, how was that i knew he was well known mm-hmm. right but i was kind of sheltered from it because i lived in the uk i grew up in the uk right i lived with my mom i went to boarding school yeah so while i had this idea that he was known i didn't really know what that meant or really yeah. see it or anything it didn't really hit me till i lived in india okay but um, and that's when that's when it really did hit me because then I ser- I realized that I was getting scrutinized for every little thing that I was doing. Mm-hmm. And that was, of course, not because of my own achievements. That's because I was his son. Right. Why? But growing up, um, you know, I, I obviously could see that we were well to do and that sort of stuff. But I don't I don't really ever think about that he was well known or anything mm-hmm. like that. 
So you don't really see that fame, do you? Because you were here, but you just said something. So you moved to India and you were yeah. scrutinized for his achievements. T tell me about that. Well, not necessarily his achievements. I was, I was sort of like scrutinized um, because I was the son of someone that was well known. Okay. Uh, a figure who you'd say was polarizing. You know, there was there was a lot of people quick to to, to, to see what I was up to and to judge me. And um, I think that a lot of people came to a lot of conclusions about me like what? based on the family that I came from as opposed okay. to knowing me. Mm -hmm. like, like you said, like he's got everything he wants. He doesn't do anything. He has this. He has that mm -hmm. um, without really knowing what was going on within. Um, so it was all very surface level stuff. But again, and I say that because no one would have given me that amount of interest or would have cared if I wasn't his son yeah. and he wasn't who he was. So obviously your dad went through a bit of a tumultuous time. So in 2008, I think it was, where everything kind of came crashing down. So you you moved to India when, when everything was good or when everything was bad? So it wasn't quite 2008. It, um, you know, it was a little bit later. Okay. Um, and when we say things crashing down, I think we got to be a little bit careful about trying to put everything in one bracket because, yes, it was the airline that, got into trouble mm -hmm. uh, financially. And again, there was economic reasons, there yes. were political reasons, mm -hmm. there were business reasons mm -hmm. why businesses don't succeed. Yeah. Um, at the time, the cost of fuel was exceptionally mm -hmm. high. So anyway, for an airline to survive in the best of times, it's difficult. And during that period, it was even harder. But then again, what people forget is that the airline was its own entity. Right. There was also the spirits division, which was doing very well at the mm -hmm. time. It was the biggest company in the world by volume of alcohol sales. Mm -hmm. um, the beer, as you mentioned, yeah. was doing very well. Mm -hmm. And a number of other parts of the business were doing great. But of course, everything got centered around this airline. And that's, uh, you know, sort of where people think everything came crashing down because it got sort of, you know, everything got rolled into that. Um, so, yeah. I was I was there when I guess when that started, but then I'd left uh, when when things really kicked off. It's very hard to watch uh, the media and the press completely tarnish someone's reputation and kind of constantly. There's a barrage of comments, even on your Instagram today. You uploaded a picture of your dad, I think, a couple of days ago, and there's so many negative comments on there. There's actually not that many. A few. There's. About 500 comments. Yeah. I'd say 490 of them are positive. So I'll take 10 negative comments for a for a post. So during this time when that was happening, how old were you? Gosh, I guess let's say the thing sort of started around 2011, 12, things kicked off. And he's kind of, he's been in the UK since 2016. So okay. let's, let's call it 10 years. 10 All right. Years. So I would have been 25 at the okay. time. Um, young, yeah, young, mm -hmm. but not a child. Yes, and I tell you, I feel blessed that social media didn't exist when I was a child. Mm -hmm. Just in general, like yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean that's like, this could be its own discussion about, and, I, and I'm actually very interested in seeing just the effects on social media on kids mm -hmm. growing up. But anyway, that's beside the point. I think initially it was very hard. Mm -hmm. And it's still hard. Don't get me wrong. Like someone says something negative about anyone I care about, of course. right? Whether it's my dad, whether it's you, whether it's mm -hmm. anyone, I'm going to get upset because of that's course. the sort of person I am, right? Mm -hmm. But I think what the, the hardest part of it was reading things which were just simply untrue. Okay. And based on um, things that were being said about him in the media, which weren't perhaps true either. Mm -hmm. Um and I think it was more sort of frustration where it's like, because if you've seen, and you obviously did your research on all of this, my dad hasn't actually ever spoken out. He hasn't, he hasn't done any interviews. He hasn't mm -hmm. done anything. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a frustration for me being like, oh, what if they, if they knew the truth or if they knew another side of it, would it be different? Okay. Now it's got a lot better because I think things are starting to unravel and think people are starting to see a different aspect, a uh, okay. different side of things and mm -hmm. people who were quick to jump to certain conclusions. Yep. Perhaps have now reconsidered and rethought and it's, um, you know, it, it, it's better. Mm -hmm. I mean, this interview isn't about your dad. So I don't no. want to go into the details of what happened and what didn't. But from what I can see, 
there was a time in which people are very negative. And now for me, as I'm growing my platform, and I think a lot of people on social media, one thing that puts people from speaking out about things is constantly receiving negative comments. And it happens to me, it's happening to me a lot more now. And sometimes it's very difficult when you wake up in the morning and you see these horrible comments that are said about you. And especially when they're said about someone you love. So for me, when people are horrible about my guests, I feel more hurt than when they're horrible about me. How did you kind of navigate through that? You know, it's it's it it, it takes its toll. I, I wrote about this in the book and mm. about how it it hurts. Um, and you've got to allow it to hurt. Mm -hmm. You can't pretend it doesn't exist. When people are like, "Oh, just let it go," well, they're probably people who haven't actually experienced it. Yeah. Right. And it and it and it hurts. And and you can't help but. You know, and, and at the same time, I think I've it, I've come to an understanding and an acceptance that I'm my own person, right? I've been doing my own mm. things. But whatever's said about my dad, I'm always going to get drawn into it. Of course. Right? I mean, we've been talking for 20 minutes and 15 of those minutes have been talking about how I'm someone else's son. And this mm -hmm. is meant to be my interview. And this is not your fault or anything like that. But did you see how unconsciously yeah. people automatically bring it back into one focus? So it, it's an acceptance. Mm -hmm. And um, and that what, so that's what helps deal with it. That was my next question. You know, live when you have such a, a father who's such a prominent figure, it's difficult to live in their shadow and it's difficult to live out their shadow because it feels like you're always connected. Now you're doing so many different things for yourself, which is so powerful. But one of the things that I think is the most incredible thing you've done is how you've opened up and you've written this book. Yeah, the book. Tell me is, about that journey. The book is, uh, I'm very proud of the book um, because you know, first of all, writing a book is not easy. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, I'm proud of myself for being so open. Mm -hmm. But really where the pride comes from is from the amount of people that have messaged me since it came out being like, thank you so much for writing it. I could resonate with it. Mm -hmm. It helped me in different ways. And and knowing that you've been able to do something to contribute in a positive way to society and touch someone else's life, there's no feeling like it. And I'm, you get it. You're doing mm -hmm. these podcasts. and. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm very proud of what you've been doing. And I've, as you said, I've seen you since the beginning kind of of your journey and how you've grown. And, you know, it's not it's not easy. You're mm -hmm. a South Asian woman, mm -hmm. right? It's not easy. You're talking about topics that our community and culture doesn't necessarily talk about. Mm -hmm. And I went through the exact same thing with the book, mm -hmm. right? And there were a lot of people who couldn't understand why. And I'm sure there are people here who are like, why is this girl doing this? Uh -huh. So I think you can, you probably For can sure. relate a lot more than uh, in the journey. And um, definitely what happens is that, but then you know that the people you do touch, it's worth it. I, I completely agree. I, I loved your book. I read it in like two days. It was mm -hmm. amazing. It's so easy to read, but there are, there are so many things that I love about it because you're very vulnerable. I want to talk around depression and how you went through that because men's mental health, as much as everyone thinks it's not a taboo, it is still a taboo. I met so many people yesterday who said, as a guy, it's very difficult to open up. Why did you feel comfortable to start talking about it? And when did you start unraveling the fact that you were feeling those ways? It was after I left drama school in, God, this is now 2016. The years have just flown, right? Mm -hmm. Fair enough. We did lose two of them to the yeah, pandemic. So. Of course. Um, I was just waking up in the morning and I, as I said in the book, like I was feeling not right. Mm -hmm. And I think perhaps if I hadn't gone into art acting, I would have just like many people do, just buried it and quote unquote soldiered on. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not soldiering on. It means it's just repressing something which is going to come up at some point. Yeah. Like anything you push down, it's going to come up. Mm -hmm. But then it was it was at that point where I was like, you know what? I've opened up so much at drama school. Let me go and speak to a therapist. And I did. And she really helped me unravel and understand why I was feeling certain ways, where it was stemming from things mm -hmm. from years and years and years ago. And as I got more open I started being more open, you know, I talked about stopping drinking online and mm -hmm. I realized that I got a big response from people. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, you know, I want to talk about this more because out of 100 people, if 99 people think it's junk, yep. fine. But if it's going to help that one person feel less alone, then it's job well done. 
But taking that first step to go to therapy is very difficult, especially if you don't come from a family where it's talked about normally. You know, it, when I first went to therapy, it wasn't like my parents were like, oh, we've been to therapy, you should go to therapy. It was more, I was in a place of, oh my God, I just need to speak to someone else where I don't feel guilty for constantly burdening the them theme. with my problems. Yeah. So let me go to a therapist. And it was because my friends around me were going to therapy. But where did you kind of get that courage to take that first step? I actually started going... Um, when I was at drama school, okay, um, I it wasn't therapy per se. It was like there were there were counselors in the school, okay, um, and I went and talked to one, and I was like, oh, "This is quite good." Mm -hmm. But then I got then I said like I want to go and do more of it, and I started doing it in London with a therapist, which I didn't like, and that nearly put me off doing it again. Um, it's all to do with the person you speak to, Definitely. right? And then I was like, I I, I like the, I like to talk, as you can clearly see. Uh, and I'm and I'm open about talking about things, but I don't. I want to feel like I'm being. I, I, I'm I'm a very sort of, like they say, like a what you can't cage a wild animal. If you give mm -hmm. me my space to do my thing, I'm very happy. But if I feel like I'm being controlled or caged, I can't like stand it. it. And that first therapist I went to was sitting there with the notepad and this and that, and I just felt like like this is not like I can't be open with you because you're not making me feel, feel open. open. Yeah. So now I got back to America and spoke to my um my doctor. Uh, and he's like, look, I know this amazing woman. Why don't you go and give it a go? I was like, go on, then I'll give it a go. And she was just, she gave me exactly what I was looking for, which was that space to just be. Yeah. So going, you kind of went through depression when you were, and you talk about this a lot in your book. Tell me that process of how you kind of came out of it. Because there are a lot of people that are watching and listening to this podcast that first initially don't know how to take that first step. Yeah. But secondly, don't see at that light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, well, I think it's, I think it, it's hard to generalize. And I think it's a different journey for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the time, well, for me, coming out of it was, an, an, first of all, you got to accept it, right? Most of the time, why we, 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 we're in so much pain is because we have this civil war going on within, within us. Mm -hmm. We feel a certain way and then we tell ourselves we shouldn't feel a certain way and then it's back and forward within us, Yeah. right? And that's the guilt you talk about. It's guilt. It's, it's a number of things people feel like why they shouldn't feel a certain way or they can talk mm -hmm. themselves out of it or snap out of it and all that stuff. But for me, what really helped was by talking about it, I really understood it and I understood where it was coming from. Mm -hmm. And that's what then helped me take the steps. I right? always feel confronting a problem allows you to solve a problem. And for so many of us, we avoid confronting because we don't want to uncover any of the issues we yeah. have, good or bad. I, I agree. And... I think, I think the word confronting, and I understand fully where you're coming from when you say it, mm -hmm. does come with slightly negative connotations 100%. associated with it because it, it, it comes with a sort of a aggressive, aggressive energy, the word so confrontation. True. So I prefer like just looking at it. Yeah. You just have to look, right? Mm. You don't even have to do anything. You don't have to confront. You don't have to be strong. You, have to, you just have yes. to allow it to happen and then see, okay, where do I want to go from here? And I think spending time in solitude is another thing I always talk about because so often when we're talking to our friends or families or whoever, we're surrounded by that noise. Yeah. And spending that time in solitude to really understand your thoughts, really just to think about how am I feeling? It allows you to then think about the next step, which is why am I feeling like this? It's a step. And I think a lot of people avoid the solitude because, first of all, we're a society that's even more so today being being conditioned to be mm -hmm. out and about. Mm -hmm. People avoid solitude because then you have to listen to your thoughts. You have to do and, and, and if you if you're doing other things, you can at least avoid it. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. You're right. I think I think it, it does. You can have someone we can have chats like this. Mm -hmm. you, I can write books. People can write, read the book. You can go to therapy. But eventually it has to all come from within. So true. Right? Now, people mm -hmm. can help you see things. Yeah. But eventually you have to decide, okay, how do I want to respond to what's happening and where do I want to go from here? One of the things you, you speak about in the book, which I found really powerful and something that I want to dive a bit deeper into is guilt. Mm. I think a lot of us feel guilty about a lot of things. For me, as you said, on this podcast, sometimes I share too much or sometimes I don't say things in the right way or sometimes I think, oh God, I wish I never mentioned it. And I feel so much guilt from it afterwards. And I kind of berate myself into thinking, why did I do that? 
how do we kind of move away from that moment where we're constantly feeling guilty about everything? Because I'm always in a conflict. I want to share a message and talk around controversial things, but I also want to be a really good girl and I want to not be so confrontational. I want to not be the person who's so difficult because I've been labeled those things. How do I find that balance? Okay, so there, there I think you're talking about two different things, right? Mm -hmm. I think that you're talking about more about fear of expression. Mm -hmm. and expressing yourself in an authentic way that you want to. Yeah. Right? And, and by the sounds of it, and again, I'm not some clinical expert, but it, it sounds like you're not... You, I teach acting now as right. well, right? I'm, yeah. I act, but I'm also teaching it to people. And mm -hmm. what you realize is that a lot of people don't express themselves on stage in characters because there's a conditioning in them from very young that's told them that they should behave a certain way. Wow. Right? Now, South Asian girl, mm -hmm. you would definitely would have been brought up, whether they were instilled into you or whether mm -hmm. they were there, you would have been brought up in a supposed structure. Correct. What you were meant to do, what you should be doing, how you should get married, la, 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 right? There's a mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. quote, unquote, a system that... Now, breaking out of that system, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Even though you might know it's the right thing to do, yes. it's uncomfortable because we as human beings, change is scary, mm -hmm. right? Change is scary. You know, if Shivani sits here and just plays by the book and doesn't doesn't say anything and just, you know, you know doesn't um, poke the bear mm -hmm. or, or anything like that, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. But then there's a part of you that's like, I want to be that. I want to ask the tough exactly. questions. But what's scary about that is you don't know what the outcome is going to be the other side. You could have a thousand people clapping you, which yeah. you probably will, but there could be others. And it, it's the unknown which is more scary. And it's almost when I say something that's a little bit controversial, people, and I say, gosh, the comments are hard. People will say, well, what do you expect? Well, it, it, you know, you're it, asking for it. You're asking for it. You also have to... You have to, see, so here's the thing, right? And this comes to anything in life. This comes to art. It comes to this. It comes to anything you do. Mm -hmm. Your relationship, romantic relationship, parent relationship. You have to kind of figure out who you want to be, mm -hmm. right? And commit to that. And when you do that, mm -hmm. it's going to feel uncomfortable and there will guaranteed be people who make you feel like you're doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Why? It's because they didn't have the courage to snap out of it and be mm -hmm. themselves, right? You're so right. There's no one path for everyone, mm -hmm. right? Everyone has, you can be whoever you want. And it's interesting you say that because I, I, I ran a workshop yesterday around goal setting and I said to everyone, once you figure out your why, it doesn't matter what everyone else says. It's like I did a clip around homeless people. And even though I didn't articulate myself in the right way, even though I didn't say the most perfect line, because again, this podcast is a podcast, not a speech. At the end of it, even though 90% of the comments were negative on this platform, I said, but I did it with the right intent. And I'm okay with that. And I think you become more and more comfortable, but it is still hard at times. Like you said, that never goes away. But more sometimes you become more equipped to deal with it. For sure. And I, I think, look, I'm not saying... I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this or what. You are. Not, but don't go around and be a dick. Right? Yeah. And be like, you know. Yeah, I don't care. Like, just be like a dick. I don't care what people think about yeah. me. I can say this. I can say that. That's that's a very different thing. Mm -hmm. Right? There's a, there's a difference between those people, and right. there's plenty of them out there, mm -hmm. than someone like you who's going around trying to do something. You can't please everyone. Yeah. Right? You've got to remember that. You can't mm -hmm. please everyone. We, we, we have this in acting all the time people get up on the scene and they try to do the scene the perfect way yeah and i was like you're gonna keep failing and they're like why i said because there is no fucking perfect way to do it you're you're, you're trying to be something that doesn't exist mm -hmm. it's all subjective right mm -hmm. what you're doing right now is subjective now you're an accountant mm -hmm. and you go and balance your balance sheets right you can't be like well fuck <laughs> it i don't care if the numbers don't add up because you can see the numbers don't add up yeah right Two plus two is four, mm -hmm. right? If you go and write two plus two equals 19, yeah, well, and try and justify it, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. But when you're in an art form, mm -hmm. which this is, yeah. which what I do is, which what writing is, there is no right and wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. And the acceptance comes from the fact that there will be people who agree with you. There will be people who disagree with you. 
there will be people who love what you do. There will be people who think it's absolute trash. And guess what? They're all correct. That's so true. It's it's true. My, I had I this on that. the book. My mum went onto Amazon after the book, and she's reading all the reviews, and it was like these amazing reviews. And then there was like five star review, five star review, and then there was one one star review, and the guy was like, "This is." trash this book absolutely bad la 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 my mum was like really upset by it okay and i was like listen you know the people who left me the five star reviews mm -hmm. and you know the guy who left me the one star review you know which one of them is right mm -hmm. both of them I love because that. it's their own personal it's opinion their own opinion and we can't change everyone's opinions and you can't i said this before as well it's it's incredibly narcissistic of me to expect everyone's gonna love everything i say well it's not only it's not narcissistic it's more it's more how many people are we up to now? Like 9 billion or so, 7 billion mm -hmm. on the planet, whatever it is. How can you please 7 billion individuals? Yeah. It's, it's just not possible, right? As you're speaking about this, I feel you're so strong and you've got it all together. And you and people watching this probably think, well, Sid never has bad days. You're always, your response is always like this. I'll let it go. I'll always be strong. Is, it tr is that true? All right. I'm going to stop you for one second, right? Keep this camera rolling. Okay. What are you doing? I want to show you something. Okay. Is this on the podcast? Yeah, this is on the podcast. Okay. This is on. Okay. All right, I'm back. <laughs> what you just said about I always have it together, mm -hmm. right? And that I'm always so put to bed together. That is anxiety medication that I take three times a day. On top of Prozac that I take for my OCD. This one I meant to take at lunchtime. If I had a bottle of water, I'd take it right now on camera. I'm not ashamed by it, right? So when you say I've got it all together, sure, I might have it all together, but the person who looks like he's got it all together is on anti-anxiety medication, mm -hmm. antidepressants, and I'm completely okay with it. So thank you for showing that. Yeah, and it's because important. It's important. don't talk about it. Why do you feel comfortable now to talk about it? We need to change as a society to become more accepting, Yeah. right? And the only way we're going to do that is to get people comfortable around the conversation. Mm -hmm. And the only way we can get people comfortable around it is to talk about it. And you know what? Again, like right now, people might be like, oh, it's like anxiety medication. Like, like, so what? If one person watches this and they're like, oh, cool. I, like, I take that as well. Yeah. Thank you for him uh, sharing it. Mm -hmm. Then you've helped someone. And then that person's going to feel more open and yes. could go and help someone else. And suddenly now it's a knock on effect. For sure. And also if someone's listening to this and thinking, I'm so afraid of taking it because it's going to change who I am and become, I'm going to become addicted. Talk to me about your process of, of taking that. Because I remember you did say to me, your mom was very upset when she saw yeah, that. Yeah, well, so in 2016, mm -hmm. they gave me um, 5MG of Ciprolex was the brand. Okay. Five milligrams of Ciprolex, which was an antidepressant. Nothing. 5MG is nothing. Okay. Um, they were like, you know, the doctor was like, this make you feel better. But after like a month or so, I was like, I don't really like this. Okay. Stopped it. Then last year when I was writing the book, right, I have clinical OCD. Mm -hmm. And I was obviously writing about my OCD in the book, which was yes. bringing up a lot. So my therapist was like, speak to a psychiatrist. And they gave me Prozac, which again is another type of antidepressant. So you've got Ciprolex, Prozac, Fluoxetine. Okay. So Fluoxetine is the... Um, general name for Prozac, um, you know, there, there's different types, but all do the same kind of thing. And different things work for different people. I was on 20 MG, then we went up to 40, 60, I think I'm on 60 MG of it today. Okay. Not because I'm depressed, but it's because it helps with the OCD. So antidepressant medicine, mm -hmm. an OCD medicine, it helps the same thing. Mm -hmm. I have no problem taking it. And, you know, for those of you who know me watching this, know that my dad's going through some stuff right now. It's mm -hmm. been a pretty difficult last three months. Um, I've had various people in my life pass away and mm -hmm. it's been a lot of stress. So that's why the psychiatrist said, give me this and said, take this for a bit. It might help. Mm -hmm. Um the name will come to me of what this is, um, but I forget. If okay. it comes to me, I'll tell you. And I and I take it because I'm like, it makes me feel better, right? And you take your vitamins in the morning, right? If you've got a headache, you're not questioning popping a Nurofen, mm -hmm. right? So why would I question taking these meds if they're actually doing their job to help me feel better? I think some people- And are, helping me. I think some people are very hesitant to take um, anti-anxiety medication or medication surrounding depression because they think they're going to become addicted on it. And I remember speaking to my friend about this and she said, 
in those moments, you feel like you cannot get out. And if that medication helps you feel that you can, she was like, I came off it after three months because then I felt ready to come off it. But you it's, know, it doesn't have to be that you, you, you take it forever and it, people have this fear of it. It doesn't have to be that you take it forever. It also doesn't not have to be that you take it forever. I, I spoke to that. my therapist about this. I was like, this works for me. Should we think about moving on? She's like, listen, there's no harm. You can take this for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned right now, I'll keep taking these pills for the rest of my life. Now, I do want to say, because I know we're going to have people who say this, who watch this. Oh, well, not everyone's got access to antidepressants. It's expensive, la, la, la. True. Okay. And I, and I understand that people don't sometimes perhaps have the same access as we do to healthcare and, and stuff like that. So there are a lot of other ways, meditation, yoga. I talk about this all in the book. There are mm -hmm. other ways you can help yourself. If you're either hesitant to go on antidepressants or if you if you don't have access to them. Yeah. But I want to hit one thing that you came to because I think this is something that's very important. When my mum got upset. Yeah. A lot of the time with parents, right, when a parent hears that their child is upset. Now, we will always be children to our parents. Correct. Right? We'll always be little kids to them. Mm -hmm. When a parent hears about something that the child went through. Like if you talk to your parents and you're like, when I was 10, 100%. I felt this way. The reason they get defensive about it is not because they don't care. It's because they see it as a, as a black mark on their parenting. So true. So they take it personally being like, oh, well, what could I have done better to have made him avoid being on antidepressants? And what it is, it's like, it's actually not, not about them. Of course. But they take it personally mm -hmm. and see it as not even an attack, but like as a failure on their parental responsibilities. I love that reflection. It's so powerful because even if I talk on this podcast about I was really struggling through this time, my mom's like, you, you didn't talk to me about that. Why didn't you talk to me about that? And I always say to her, but, but you can't see that as it's your fault, but they do. And I think that's a very mature reflection to have because not a lot of people understand that and they and they mistake that with their parents aren't supporting them or their parents don't believe in them. I had the same thing with my dad. My mum is, is always from a young age being like, you're so amazing, you're so amazing, you're so amazing. And my dad's always been the one that's like, prove me wrong. And for so long, I was like, why don't you support me? But he's protecting me. And I have to remind myself he's of that. He's protecting you and he's also supporting you in the way that he knows. Correct. Right? Which may not necessarily reflect or align with us. So right? People believe that, again, written in the book, mm -hmm. this is all shameless plugs, but, you know, it, it <laughs> is true. good. It's, it's true, true, though. It's that we do, we're, we're different human beings, you and me, mm -hmm. right? We've got quite close as friends and mm -hmm. whatever, but we still have differing opinions. Of course. And that's normal in friends. Mm -hmm. People have this belief, especially in the Indian culture, that family is everything. Blood is thicker than water. Fair enough. Fair point. But that doesn't have to mean that you agree or see eye to eye or share the exact same values as every single person in your family, including your parents, because you're different people. Mm -hmm. Now, your dad might have a specific way of encouraging you. Correct. But that's not the way that Shivani wants encouragement. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean you're wrong. It doesn't mean he's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just from a different way of looking at things. Right? And communicating that is important. It, we talk around the love languages. I think we should also have that conversation with other people apart from our partner around the love languages. I spoke about it previously on this podcast. But as you were just speaking around family and you don't have to agree with everyone and everything, you talk a lot in your book around setting boundaries. And, you know, one of the things that I love about you is you're always there to listen, but often when you're there to listen a lot of the time, people feel like they can offload their problems on you. And given this podcast and given this role, I feel like a lot of people think that they can do that to me even more. And sometimes it can feel really overwhelming because I'm so grateful for everyone that supports me. But unfortunately, I can't be an on-hand therapist that replies to everyone's DMs yeah. every single day. How do you set those boundaries with the people that you love? So to be honest with you, I'm actually terrible at setting boundaries. Um, you know, I want to be there for everyone. I want to help everyone mm -hmm. uh, to my own detriment at times. And, you know, I feel like that's my best quality. Yeah. It's possibly also at times my worst quality. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I, what I like is that I, when, when people close to me come and confide or they want advice or stuff, What's nice is it makes you feel like, okay, well, I'm a trustworthy person, like they came to you kind mm -hmm. of thing, right? 
But then you have to go back and look at what is your root for wanting to help someone, okay? So if you want to help someone because you feel like, oh, well, I'm better off than them and I'm, I'm, I'm privileged and they're not mm -hmm. so much, I owe it to them. Mm -hmm. Well, now the root cause of wanting to help them is actually guilt. Does that make sense? Yep. So powerful. Someone DMs you and you want to reply to them and you're like, oh God, if I don't reply to them, I might lose a subscriber. Now your root cause for wanting to help that person is fear, right? Yeah. Everything comes down to what do you want to get? What is the cause of you wanting to help that person? The intent. When people come to me and they're like, for example, when you came to me and two years ago and you're like, when you do this podcast, I'm trying to launch it. I loved the message you were trying to put out mm -hmm. there. And I was like, 100%. Okay, mm -hmm. we met through your cousin who I went to university with. We'd mm -hmm. never met. And, no. and we got, like, we would speak on the phone a lot without actually knowing each other. Mm -hmm. But I felt like I want to help this person. Mm -hmm. And that's coming from a place of love. Yes. Not guilt, not obligation, not mm -hmm. fear. It's actually coming from love because I like, what they're doing so mm -hmm. i think you should it, it's very important to see why you're helping someone and that, that can help you determine where to draw the boundaries that is so powerful and I, I always talk around intention but i think what you've just broken down there is help is you always feel when you're trying to help someone that you're trying to help them but is it because it's actually on you or is it because it's actually for them it it, it depends and um you know, you know, at times you can think that you're doing the right thing by helping someone when actually you're not. Yeah. You're kind of enabling whatever's going on to continue. Right. Sometimes help doesn't come in the form of saying yes. Mm -hmm. Help can also come in the form of actually saying no. And drawing a boundary can actually be at times the most helpful thing you can do for someone. Saying, saying no is, is very uncomfortable though. Like you said, it's something that, especially for people like you and I, when, when we feel that it's our duty to help and people come to us and you feel valued for that saying no can often feel that you're closing people down and you're being dismissive and you're not being who you truly are yes and i think that's coming down to people you feel valued for people coming to you yeah the other thing is are you helping someone because you're helping them to make yourself feel valued feel you know what i mean yeah. like without helping them you don't feel like you're enough yeah you actually need it for your own validation. So again, it comes down to the root cause of why you want to help someone. And saying no at times, well, always is very uncomfortable, but at times it might feel terrible to you, but it might be the best thing for them. Mm -hmm. And other times I've had people come to me for advice and I've said no because I just haven't been in a position to offer them the right advice. Sometimes it's better to keep your mouth shut if you don't know what you're talking about Agreed. than try and offer some sort of advice that might do more damage. Like there are a lot of times people come to me and I'm like, listen, that's something that I am not qualified to, to okay. answer. I wouldn't be doing justice to you if I tried to answer that. It wouldn't mm -hmm. be right. So go and speak to someone else. But your values, your values have to be in place there because a lot of people, I, I offer coaching, a lot of people come to me and they say, struggling in my relationship, I'm struggling with this. And I'm like, I'm not a licensed therapist and I'm so sorry. And they're like, but I don't mind. It's, it's okay, you can still help me, I'll still pay you. And I'm like, if something goes wrong, I can't, I can't take that responsibility because I I'm not pro I'm not a professional in that in that field. You know that a lot of people and this is why I appreciate like the work you're doing like this. You it, it's not trying to be professional. Right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people have asked me they're like why didn't you go into this coaching? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? First of mm -hmm. all, it's not something of, of interest to me. But yeah. secondly, I'm not in a position where I feel comfortable to do it. Correct. There are a lot of life coaches out there. Yep. There are a lot of influential people that preach messages that they don't fucking have a clue what they're talking about, mm -hmm. right? And they amass these big followings because, mm -hmm. you know, it's very surface level stuff and people resonate with it. Mm -hmm. But underneath the surface, there's fuck all, right? Mm -hmm. And I know you're not someone that would ever want to do that. I'm certainly not someone that ever wants to do that. Mm -hmm. And then you have to look at those people. Okay, well, why, why, why do you like doing it? Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is that's narcissism. They don't actually do it to help the others. They do it because they're feeding off the glory of having people listen to them, right? Mm-hmm.
So the intention isn't Tension's there. Tension's not there. If you don't know something, it's it's better to just say, I don't know. That's that that's a funny one. I've spoken about that a lot. And I, and I speak about that a lot in organizations when I when I do workshops. A lot of the time, managers just say, yeah, 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 I know this. They'll continue this awful cycle instead of just being uncomfortable and saying, I don't know. Why are so many of us afraid to not say that we know everything and we're the, we're the gurus and, and know every single thing in the world? Because it's vulnerability, right? It's vulnerable. It's human nature. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what it's like in the younger generation. Right? Yeah. I mean, maybe that's been different, but you know, it all comes from that showing like it's control, right? The minute you say, I don't know, you're technically out of control. So true. And when you feel out of control, you feel vulnerable. Mm -hmm. When you feel vulnerable, you feel scared. Well, most people want to avoid feeling vulnerable, so they'll pretend they're in control. And how do you kind of come out of that? So for you, I'm sure you were in, in stages of your life where you never wanted to share. Huge. And I went through the process, like you said, and felt very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. To the point that today, saying, I don't know, or like, oh, shit, I'm so sorry, or like, oh, I had an opinion, you had an opinion, we've discussed it. Thank you for giving me a different way to view it. Mm. It actually feels really good. Yeah. Like it feels really light. Mm. And being like, being able to put my hands up and be like, oh, actually, you know what? Thank you for that. I, I, I had no idea. It I, actually feels really nice. I like, be, you know, it's, it, it's nice to actually be open and receptive to other people. And I think when people see that, they think, okay, you were here and now you've got to here. And they think it's like this. Actually, you feel uncomfortable and then you feel a little bit better and then you feel uncomfortable and you feel a little bit better and you feel uncomfortable. And it's, it's a growing path You might continue to feel uncomfortable. Anything. You might always feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? You'd be the fittest athlete in the world, right? Fittest athlete on the planet. Mm -hmm. When you go to the gym, you're still going to feel sore, even if you've been playing the sport for 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with growth. It's, it's a, a continuous change. It's a continuous change. And, you know, you might not feel uncomfortable for 10 months then you might feel uncomfortable again. Well, I used to then see that as a sign of regression. Like, oh, I must have gone back because I'm feeling uncomfortable yes. again. But then it's a change of a mindset, really. Like it's actually, it's continuous growth, which means it's continuous uncomfortability. And really all we can do as people is to get comfortable being uncomfortable. One of the things I spoke to you about in, in the first podcast we did, which I remember very clearly, and I asked you this, the more self-aware you become, the more self-conscious you become. And I felt that as well. The more self-aware I've become, the more conscious I am about how the people feel. I'm thinking about what they th they think, that, that I'm thinking about their thoughts, I'm thinking about their actions. I'm, I'm constantly thinking, oh, have I done the right thing? Because now I feel, well, I understand so many different emotions and therefore I must act according to those. So what happens, right, is that, and this is, oh, okay, I'm going to quote this because it's uh, the book, The Untethered Soul. Michael yeah. Singer. Not one of my favorites, I'll be honest with you. Okay. Great book, but it just it, certain books just don't resonate with you. But there okay. was something very good in that which did. Now, what happens is that you live in a structure mm -hmm. of beliefs, right? You then become self-aware and you become self-conscious and now you want to... The whole idea of it is to take you out of that cage, mm. to live freely. But then what happens, what you're talking about, is that now you become so self-conscious, you now believe that because you're enlightened or in tune or whatever it is you now must behave a certain way correct so you've gone from believing you must behave a certain way to again believing you must behave a certain way so you're actually in the same cage Correct. and what he talks about in the book is just because you've put pretty pictures and paintings up on the wall it's still a cage does that make sense? Yeah. So you go from once I did this whole thing you go from one set of rules yeah right? let's call it the Non-conforming. So, yeah. Well, let's call it the South Asian rules that we're brought up by. Yes. Right? You should do this. Family first. Do this. Shivani, you should be married by this age. You should be doing this. Da, 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 da. Rules. Mm -hmm. When you become self-conscious, you become self-aware and like, no, I don't want to follow those rules. Yeah. Well, now you see things about yourself and you're like, oh, well, well I have to now. I, I've become enlightened, so I must think like this or I mustn't feel this or I mustn't yeah. do that. Well, now do you realize what you're doing is... Now you're thoughts. just creating your own rules and now you're abiding by another set of rules. Mm. Real freedom comes from realizing there aren't, we're eventually getting away from rules and realizing that it's all a fluid process. That's so powerful. I remember you telling me that in the second podcast, I mean, in the first podcast, so thank and, you. And I will tell you this on that. I want to say is that that was about a year and a half ago and this is important for your viewers as well. I told you that then, but it was still a mental concept to me. 
Mm. It's only now that I can talk about it because I've actually started living it. And a lot of the time, I think it's important. We understand things as a mental concept. Yeah. But understanding from a mental concept to actually putting it into practice can take years. Yeah. You're looking at years worth of unconditioning, mm -hmm. right? The older you are when you start doing this work, the more it's going to take simply because there's more life in you that you need to change. It's so powerful everything you're saying. And, and I think one thing I've really learned from you is just to be so open and free within yourself and then you'll learn to be open and free with other people. So before we close, what's one piece of advice you'd give to anyone listening or watching this, going through a really, really tough time and thinking, I don't know how to snap out of it? Know that you're not alone, right? I think, I think, that's the, that if, I think when you're going through something, mm -hmm. whatever it might be, mm -hmm. mental, physical, whatever it is, the mind can make us believe like we are alone. Yeah. We are the only one right now feeling the way that we are. Mm -hmm. It's hopeless. No one can understand me. No one understands. But there are a lot more people who do understand than we perhaps give credit for. Mm -hmm. So remembering that you're not alone. There are people out there. Mm -hmm. Should give people hopefully the confidence to open up. Mm -hmm. Go and seek help. Mm -hmm. Talk to people. Because you'll find that, you know, there are a lot more people out there who can relate to you than you perhaps think. And I think that was one of my big things of writing the book was it's not a self-help book, right? Mm -hmm. It's just an open account. Yeah. And it was to show people that you're not alone. And that's what most of the messages people have said to me is they're like, you know, I haven't given them some 10 step way to live their life where no. people are like, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> no, people have phoned me by being like, thank you for making me feel like I'm not the only one going through something. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, that's just all people need is to feel like they're understood and they're heard and they're seen and that other people can relate to what's going on. And I think that's done by by when you're very raw and honest. Well, that's it. You have to be open about it, right? And that's why I've got a good title, If I'm Honest. If I'm Honest. I, the, the reason also that came is also because I realized when I'm writing, I kept writing like, and if I'm honest, if I'm honest, if I'm, and I was like, oh, yeah, maybe that, that was with the book name. So that works. <laughs> And, you know, I, I remember when you did the Consider This series, yeah. I remember how open you were on that. And I remember thinking, gosh, it doesn't take fancy equipment or an amazing studio or anything. You just have to start somewhere. Yep. And even if that means talking to, uh, yesterday when people were saying to me, you know, I'm just not confident. I never feel like I can ask a question. I said, well, you just come up to me and ask me a question. Exactly. You are confident. It's it's you have to take the step. Yeah. Right? We talk about this in acting all the time. We're in a studio right now. Great. We've got great lighting. We've got microphones and everything. But we, we could have done this on an iPhone. And we did, and we do, did it. do it on an yeah. iPhone, right? So we tell people when the people are like, oh, well, I don't have the opportunity to act. I don't have an agent or I yeah. don't have contacts. I don't have auditions. No, it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. You have an iPhone with a camera that's better than most <laughs> of the cinematic cameras there are. Yeah. You get your friends together. You can shoot something. Yeah. Right. You want to get your message out there, whether you have 100 million followers, you have 100,000 followers, you have 100 followers, you have one follower. There are ways to get your message out there and there are ways for you to get yourself out there. So true. So these limitations are self-imposed limitations because we live in an age today mm -hmm. where the ease to access to get out there has never been higher. So true. And I think this is referring back to what we said before, you know, when I first did a podcast with you, it was over Zoom mm -hmm. in my house at 11 p.m. at night over a 50 pound microphone. And now two years later, we're here in a studio where it looks a bit more professional. And hopefully in five years time, we'll be on a TV show. And I think that's the growth that we all want to see everything happen within a short period of time. When I started my podcast, I wanted it to be like this from day one. And I, and I didn't release an episode for six months because I remember thinking it's not good enough. But if I didn't take that first step, then I wouldn't be here today. And that's what I want to encourage everyone to do is take that first step. It may look small right now, but one day all those small steps will make you reach that big step. And all those small goals will help you reach that big goal. Absolutely. And, and I think what's also important with that is not to have a preconceived notion of how it should look. Yes. I'm not a fan. This is just a Sid thing of where do I see my life in da 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 da, mm -hmm. da You know when they sell you where you're going to be in five years? Yeah. Years? If I go back now, I've got it all wrong. Yeah, I'm 35 right. years old. I have no children. I'm mm -hmm. not married. There was no universe in my head where I thought that could be possible. Yeah. Right? 
you talk about in five years you want to be on TV. Well, if you're not on TV in five years, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you failed. Correct. It doesn't mean that you've done it wrong. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you haven't added to society, mm -hmm. right? Doing it on Zoom a year and a half ago on a 50 pound microphone, for all we know, might have helped more people than this is going to do in a studio today. It's so true. Right? So I think it's important. You're like, sure, if you used to, it looks like, okay, fine, Zoom to this, to TV's the progression. Yeah. Maybe it is, but maybe it's not. And that doesn't mean that you failed in what you've done. I love that. I've, I've, every time I speak to you, I learn so much from you. And I, I'm so grateful that we're good friends now. And, and you always help me with everything. I've, I've called you many times to be yeah, like, Sid, I, I need your help. And whatever time it is, you, you do always help me. So, so thank you for coming on again. And thank you for everything. And I'm very excited for the release of your new book. Yeah, well, same one, but being re-released by a new publisher, there might be another one in the works. But I just want to say to you, thank you for having me. And more importantly, thank you for doing this, you know, doing this podcast, doing your workshops and everything. I know it's not easy. Mm -hmm. South Asian yeah. woman, we keep saying this, but it, yeah. and, it, and it's sad. You yeah. know what? Hopefully we get to a society where we don't have to talk about that being something that works against someone. Yes. Right. That's real growth and progress. Mm -hmm. But right now it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And for you to keep doing what you're doing and to, and to grow the way that you've grown um, is, is really me. I want to say this actually to your <laughs> viewers out there. I have two friends, two friends that you've never met in your life. Mm -hmm. One of them's a big, big, big figure in India. Another one, she's a big manifestation coach out of the UAE. Mm -hmm. Both of them have put up individually on their story, your videos saying best thing on the internet right now. And I was like, how do they know her? And they're like, we don't know her. We just came across her stuff. So Aww. that is testament to the amazing work that you're doing. You. And I'm very proud and happy to help wherever I can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey everyone. And thank you so much for listening and watching this podcast. Wherever you're listening or watching, if you could please press the follow, like, and subscribe button, it would really mean the world to me.